The following is the real life story of former Major League Baseball player Glenn Burke, based on first hand documents from his life. While most scenes depict actual events from his life, some scenes are fictitious and used to move the narrative forward and contain adult language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual. For the Dodgers, Glenn Burke, Steve Yeager, and the pitcher Don Sutton. Glenn Burke playing center field tonight. Recalled from Albuquerque in 1977, June 3rd, replacing Al Downing on the roster. Signed the contract, his first World Series appearance. He takes the first pitch in the World Series from Don Gullick for ball one. Two to one, the Dodgers. So no matter where you meet a stranger, be careful if they are too friendly. If they try to win your confidence too quickly, and if they become overly personal, one never knows when the homosexual is about. He may appear normal, and it may be too late when you discover he is mentally ill. Mentally ill. He is mentally ill. Glenn Burke was a promising Major League Baseball player for the Los Angeles Dodgers and Oakland Athletics in the mid to late 1970s. Often credited with inventing the high five, Burke was forced out of the game that he loved due to his open homosexuality. He passed away at the age of 42 in 1995 after a long battle with HIV AIDS. This is his story. Was it difficult for you to hide? I mean, I know in the article how the guys always wanted you to go out drinking with them, and you had your own places you wanted to go to, and they were always wondering why you weren't with somebody that they had tried to set you up with. Yeah, also like, more considerate of them instead of myself, and I didn't want to embarrass nobody or make them feel unease, so I thought if I just kept it to myself for a while until I was ready to tell them that they might understand if they got to like me first instead of what I've done, you know, sexually or something like that. If they got to like me first, like me first, if they like me first, they might understand. Might understand. October 22nd, 1975. Pendulum Bar, the Castro District, San Francisco, California. Two down, nobody on. Joe Morgan's bloop single right now is the difference. Top of the ninth inning, he put the Reds ahead. It's a high fly ball. It should be all over. Geronimo's under, and Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox 4-3. to three. The Reds win it in Fenway Park. Them and the veterans on this team have been very frustrated. They wanted this one badly. After winning 108 times this year, setting all kinds of records, 
it would have been a deep disappointment for them not to win. So they ran up against a ball club that extended them right down to the final inning of Game 7. This was the Reds' 115th victory tonight. Oh, hey, I haven't seen you in here before. Where have you been all my life, beautiful man? <laughs> That's because it's my first night in town. First night in town? Did you just move here? Nah, I grew up in Oakland. Grew up in Oakland? How is this your first night in the Castro? I travel a lot for work. Ooh, a fancy businessman. <laughs> Not exactly. Hey, is BW smothering you over here? He's a domineering top. He can't help himself. Bitch! <laughs> no, no, we were just getting to know each other. It's okay, honey. If he gets too annoying, just jiggle your keys, toss him in the other direction, and he'll chase after them. He's easily amused and distracted. Some would call him stupid, but he takes it the wrong way. Oh my god, you ignorant slut! He said, looking into the mirror. You two should develop a comedy act. Wes gets performance anxiety if you know what I mean. Is that what we're calling your issue now? Anyway, BW, who's your new friend? He was just about to tell me before you interrupted us. Glenn, my name is Glenn Burke. Hey, Glenn Burke. My name is Wes Jackson. You already know BW here. See that guy behind the bar? Yes. That's our friend Jack McGowan. He helps run this place. Say hi, Jack! Hey! Glenn said he grew up in Oakland, but has never gone to the Castro because he travels for work. What kind of work are you in? I don't think I should say. Oh honey, if you're in porn, just say so. <laughs> it's definitely not that. Can the two of you keep a secret? I mean, really keep a secret? If my bosses knew I was gay, they'd fire me. Yes, yes. I'm a baseball player. Oh my god, that's the one with the ball that has the stitches and you wear the tight pants? Yes. That's hot. What team do you play for? Los Angeles Dodgers. Oh, Hollywood. Not quite. <laughs> I'm in their minor league system, but I hope to be playing in the big league soon. A gay baseball player? That's why I came in here tonight, to watch the last game of the World Series. When did you know that you were gay? This year. No way. Really? Yes. I just reconnected with my old junior high school teacher, who I always had a crush on. I had my first sexual experience with him almost right away. How was that? I cried. Oh no, why? I was relieved. I was relieved because for the first time I was sure of who I was. I never understood why other guys at school got so strange when they'd fall in love with some girl. I just kept thinking, I'm missing that feeling. So when I found that loving feeling, it was very emotional. Oh, that's so sweet. What do you say we keep these good vibes going? There's another fun bar down on Folsom Street. So, Glenn, tell me, do you have a type? Him. That guy right there. Oh, that's Michael Smith. That's exactly my type. He's walking over. Hey. Hey. October 21st, 1976. Uncle Bert's Bar, the Castro District, San Francisco, California. Two balls, no strikes. Two outs. Seven to two. Bottom of the ninth. Cincinnati leading. This could be it. Left field. George Foster. Geronimo Foster makes the catch. That's it. The Cincinnati Reds win the World Series in four straight. It was a sweep. The final score, Cincinnati seven, the New York Yankees two. And the Cincinnati Reds win their fourth world championship. They won in 1919, 1940, 1975, and 1976, becoming the first National League team to win in consecutive years since the New York Giants did it in 1921 and 1922. Oh my gosh, the Reds won the World Series again? Those motherfuckers. Let's go outside to the patio. I've had enough of this smoky bar. Fucking Cincinnati Reds. They ain't shit for real. Just wait until I become a full-time Dodger next year. Then it's over for them. Big Red Machine my ass. You really think you'll be a full-time Major Leaguer next year? You better believe it. 
I'll probably have to start the year in Albuquerque again, but once I get back to the show, I ain't leaving. Can you get us tickets again? That was so much fun getting to see your first game in San Francisco last year. Yes. For sure. You should come out once you go back to playing with Los Angeles. What? Yes. Think of how important it would be for the community. Yeah, and think of how detrimental it would be for my career. If you get kicked out of baseball for being gay, then you'd be a hero to the community forever. That's great, but the community doesn't pay my bills. Come on, Glenn. It's time to prove to the world that we can do anything that straight people can do. You don't know how hard I've had to work to keep this a secret. How much pressure I'm under. Lying to my teammates while I can't hang out with them. Having to put up with them always trying to set me up with some girl they know, only to have to call another woman ugly to her face just to get out of it. Having to hide my face when I'm hailing down a cab and having them drop me off three blocks away from where I was going so they don't see me walk into a gay bar. I have to spend so much time concealing a secret that would destroy me. The only peace I get is the couple months I get here in the Castro during the winter. Playing ball is the only way I know how to make money. I'm not going to piss it all away so that you can live some half-baked advocate fantasy. Oh, Glenn, stop being so melodramatic. You're only a baseball player. You're not some tragic hero in an opera. (laughs) Not that you would know anything about that. Glenn never wants to go with me to the opera. Says it's too boring. I'm not having this argument in front of my friends. Where are you going? I'm going for a walk. You know, Michael, you shouldn't force anyone to come out if they're not ready. Yeah, that's really not cool. Ah, whatever. He's just being a baby is all. He's not smart enough to see the bigger opportunity at play here. He doesn't understand that he's the one with all the leverage in this situation. Sure, his career is one thing, but he doesn't realize how much is at stake here. What is actually going on, what is actually about to happen to people like him, you, and I. But he will. We all will. You should come out, come out. You don't know how much pressure I'm under. Lying to my teammates, we have to call another woman ugly to her face. It's time to prove to the world that we can do anything that straight people can do. I have to spend so much time concealing a secret that would destroy me. Playing ball is the only way I know how to make money. Make money. He's not smart enough to see the bigger opportunity at play here. He doesn't realize how much is at stake here. What is actually going on? What is actually about to happen to people like him, you, and I? But he will. We all will. January 1977, Dade County, Florida. Anita Bryan is a former Miss Oklahoma, a pop singer with three gold records to her credit. Until just lately, she's been identified with nothing more controversial than orange juice. Well, today she's at the center of a human rights controversy raging in Dade County, Florida, where earlier this year, the county commission made it illegal to discriminate against homosexuals in hiring and in housing. Miss Bryant is leading a counterattack. Extremely religious, she says she feels that God has singled her out to spearhead a crusade to prevent admitted homosexuals from teaching her children. Anita, you're a person with a, a rather sizable investment in your career. Why are you taking this stand now and perhaps jeopardizing that? According to the word of God, it's an abomination. Uh, to practice homosexuality. And the same is true for, like, Archbishop Carroll, who took the stand that he would go to jail rather than to uh, hire known homosexuals into their schools. And our pastor said that he would do the same and would even burn the school rather than allow them to be taught by homosexuals. And uh, we feel as strongly. Now, uh, so this county ordinance is asking us, in essence, to go against the law of Florida and to go against even more important what we believe is above the law of the land, God's law. Whether you believe it or not, why should our civil rights be taken away from us? Where is your human sense of decency and fairness to people who are different than you? As long as they do their job and do not want to come out of the closet and force their homosexuality uh, on me in the areas of, of business or in the schools, they can they can live their life. And I'm, we're not going out after their jobs and trying to get them out of their teaching jobs or housing. Anita, suppose one of your children came to you, or suppose you found out in some way that one of your children was a homosexual. What would you do? Well, first of all, I would love them and not disown them because they're my children. And I would tell them that God loves them and that I love them very much. And I would try to deal with that problem in the light that God does, that he loves us 
as as uh, sinners, but he hates our sin, and that he cannot abide by sin. He cannot tolerate sin in our lives. Just biologically, that God made mothers so that we could reproduce. Homosexuals cannot reproduce biologically, but they have to reproduce by recruiting our children. Anita, have you had any particular personal experience that has made you so bitter about homosexuals? I am not bitter about homosexuals. I want to tell you something, Barbara. What God's Word says, that someone who practices homosexuality shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God is very plain on that. It's an abomination, but they have to reproduce by recruiting our children, whether you believe it or not. As long as they do their job and do not want to come out of the closet and force their homosexuality uh, on me in the areas of, of business or in the schools, they can they can live their lives. And I'm, we're not going out after their jobs and trying to get them out of their teaching jobs or anything. June 7th, 1977, Dade County, Florida. It was a decisive end to Dade County's homosexual controversy. 200,000 Miamians told their elected officials they wanted no part of the law which protects homosexuals in jobs and housing. It was an emotional issue, and the number of voters who turned out set a record for a special election. It also surprised many people that 90,000 voters wanted to keep the gay rights law on the books. That was an impressive showing for gay activists. They celebrated last night with a spirit usually reserved for winners because they believe they won recognition. One gay activist said it would not stop here. So everybody is going to be working together now in one very massive effort to do two things. First of all, guarantee human rights for everybody based on affectional and sexual preference everywhere in the nation, all through Congress. It's all happening all over the world. And Anita, we really thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. Anita Bryant's leadership to defeat the law generated the national attention. In victory last night, she talked about taking her anti-gay campaign on the road. We've already been contacted by many communities and individuals all across the nation uh, who have similar problems and are concerned and want our help. Summer 1977, West Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Hey, Spunky, did you ever finish tailoring that suit for me? Yeah, come by the shop to pick it up. You got a date? Yeah. What happened to Michael? We keep getting into fights. Oh, about what? He keeps wanting me to come out, to be the first openly gay baseball player, he says. Oh, that won't fly. That's what I keep telling him, but he insists. It's like he sees me as some kind of pet project. What do you mean? He's always trying to make me into something I'm not. Like I'm just some sort of showpiece for him. I can't figure him out. One minute he's so sweet and makes me feel like the most wonderful person in the world, and the next minute he turns on me and gets really vicious and critical. He's always holding his Harvard degree over my head, using his public speaking degree to run circles around me. Girl, forget him. You're in Hollywood. Get your sugar daddy. You like older men. Go find Rock Hudson or Anthony Perkins. They ain't gay. Honey, my friend Claire is their stylist and gets invited to some of their biggest industry parties from time to time. And some of the things she has told me she's seen... I'm like, bitch, take me. And she's like, bitch, you're 19. I'm not bringing someone who looks like my kid brother to no grown-up party. (laughs) You're too much. I don't like these Hollywood men. They all phony asses. You should come up to the Castro with me during the off-season. Those are real men. No, bitch. It's too cold up there. I prefer Southern California and those Vero Beach boys. Suit yourself. More for me. So, who has the biggest dick in the Dodger clubhouse? Besides you, that is. Oh my god, I can't with you right now. Come on. Oh, wait, 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 let me guess. Reggie Smith? No, no, no. Dusty Baker. He is smooth with his taste in music. Uh Uh-uh, I ain't playing this game with you. Ah, you're never any fun. How did your dad handle you coming out? He's Tommy Lasorda, manager of the LA Dodgers. He doesn't have any time for silly things like that. Have you told him? I try, but he always changes the subject. I don't think it's something that he wants to deal with. He keeps saying how much stress he's under trying to beat Cincinnati. How does that make you feel? Not sure. It's not like he's disowned me. We're still close and we still love each other very much. We still go out to dinner at the same place, just the two of us every Sunday the Dodgers are in town. It still seems like a priority for him to have a relationship with me. That's good. Oh, we should play a prank on him. Like what? I got it. You know how everyone on the Dodgers thinks we're dating? Um, no. Well, they do. 
Um, Spunky, that's not a good thing. Oh, no one is going to say anything. They're too afraid of my dad. Anyway, we're having a big family dinner Thursday night. Let's say you and I dress up as girls, pigtails and everything, and show up at my parents' house for dinner. Are you kidding me? Spunky, we can't do that. Your dad will shoot us in the head and then kill over from a heart attack. No question about it. I know, I know. It'd be pretty funny, though. I mean, just picture the look on his face when he opens the door. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty out of sight. Hey, Spunky, do you really think everyone on the team thinks I'm gay? Oh, I don't know for certain. I just see the way some people look at us as all. Sometimes it feels like I'm getting treated differently from everyone else on the team. How so? Whenever I'm out somewhere, it feels like I'm being followed. Like the team has hired someone to follow me. I'm sure you're just being paranoid. Besides, it's like you said, you're not going to tell anyone anytime soon, right? Right. See? Then you got nothing to worry about. Because I won't say anything either. You know how everyone in the Dodgers thinks we're dating? You know how everyone in the Dodgers thinks we're dating? Well, they do. October 2nd, 1977. Dodger Stadium, Los Angeles, California. Way to go! World Series Game 1 October 11th, 1977 Yankee Stadium, the Bronx, New York City, New York The Yankees now have gone onto the field Dodgers Okay, here's the Dodger lineup. Davey Lopes, the speedster, the great base dealer, will be leading off. He plays second base. Bill Russell, the shortstop. And batting third, perhaps the best switch hitter since Mantle and Rose, Reggie Smith. Batting fourth, the slugger, Ron Say, they call him the penguin, walks like a duck. Batting fifth, the steady going one with the great power in the opposite field, Steve Darby here at 297. Then the hero of the National League Championship Playoff Series, Dusty Baker, had two home runs then, won a grand slam, had 291 on the year. After him, the young defensive whiz in center field, Glenn Burke. After him, the shotgun arm of Steve Yeager, the catcher. And, of course, after him, a feisty, confident pitcher of the Dodgers who's never lost a postseason game, Don Sutton. Now setting the Yankees defensively in left field, Lou Fanella, good arm, and better speed than you might think from a guy his size. Fanella in left, over in center, the man who was electric during the American League Championship Series, Mickey Rivers, an arm that can be tested by these Dodgers. But in right field, it's Reggie Jackson, and he's got plenty of cannon for a throwing arm defensively in right field. At third base, Greg Nettles, as Bill White mentioned, he has a sore shoulder tonight. He may not be able to go all the way. We'll see what happens. It's a very sore shoulder. The shortstop is Bucky Dent, who came to the Yankees just before the season started this year has done an admirable job. At second base, one of the fine young players in the American League, Willie Randolph. And over at first base, a man who has been so big in Yankee fortunes the last two seasons, Chris Chambliss, the big first baseman swinging left-handed, good fielder. Herman Munson, the captain of the Yankees behind the plate, tends to throw the ball sometimes a little sidearm to second when he gets it there. And Don Gullett, who opened the playoff series for the Yankees, did not get the ball into the strike zone effectively, left with a sore shoulder, but he has fought back with heat treatments, and now suddenly here he is starting the ball game. And a year ago, he was the starting pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds against the New York Yankees. That's how the tides of fortune have changed so briefly and so recently in baseball. Davey Lopes up there with a 283 average on the season and the first picture. World Series Game 3, October 14th, 1977. Dodger Stadium, Los Angeles, California. It's time for Dodger Baseball. See number three? That's Glenn Burke. That's my boyfriend. Go, Glenn. I love you. Shut up, Michael. Shut your fucking mouth right now. What? You know goddamn well what.
World Series Game 6. October 18th, 1977. Yankee Stadium, the Bronx, New York City, New York. City Hall to be sworn in as a supervisor in San Francisco. Many of his backers were in the parade or watching it go by. At his side, his gay lover. Milk topped 12 candidates in his district to win election to the board that runs this city and county. There was a celebration on the steps of City Hall when he arrived. a high percentage of gays in this town and they are a political force here. The mayor was on the steps of City Hall to meet Harvey Milk. The gay vote is courted by nearly every politician in San Francisco. Inside City Hall, the newly elected officials introduced their wives and husbands and families. I'd like to take this brief moment to introduce my wife, Mary, and my daughters, Carolyn, Diane, and Stephanie. San Francisco will survive. Uh, Harvey Milk day. also wanted to make an introduction. Um, it is well known that I'm a gay person, and in this state, there is a law that says gay people cannot be married, but there is no law that says two human beings cannot love one another. I have a loved one. Uh, unfortunately, he is too nervous to be here. He left. Milk owns and operates a camera store. Before that, he'd been a well-paid securities analyst specializing in international finance on Wall Street and in San Francisco. His opposition to the Vietnam War ended his career in high finance and led to another change. The day Nixon invaded Cambodia was the day I had to speak out against uh, war profiteers, large corporations, and so forth. And so I got rid of my Wall Street career, which was in Montgomery Street here, and uh, when I walked through that door, I kept walking and announced to the world that I also was gay. And it was like taking a huge burden off my back. Uh, I no longer had to live a double standard, double life. Early winter, 1977. Holiday Inn, Oakland, California. Thank you for the ride, BW. Yeah. This meeting shouldn't take too long. You can come in with me if you want to. Thank you, but I'm not sure that would be appropriate. I'll just stay in the car and read the Chronicle. There's a big write-up on Harvey Milk. Okay, cool. Like I said, it shouldn't be too long. I'm sure the Dodgers GM just wants to talk about my role on the club next year and maybe even give me an extension. I'll be here. Hey, Glenn. It's so good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, Mr. Campanis. How are you? I'm doing well. And I told you, you can call me Al. Please, come on in and take a seat. Thanks. So, Glenn, tell me, how has your off-season been treating you? It's going well. Just been giving my body time to rest. It was a long season. I know, but a very fun one. Indeed. Speaking of fun, how'd you like playing on the Dodgers' winter basketball team? It was so fun. I loved getting a chance to see and hang out with the guys again. You know, basketball was always my favorite sport. Yeah, I heard you put on quite a show. Yeah, I just did my thing. I'm sure you did. Hey, listen, 
How's dating life been? You seen anyone special? What? Oh, you know. You started Game 1 of the World Series in center field, and playing for the Dodgers has to make you one of the most eligible bachelors in Hollywood, right? Uh, I guess so. Sure it does. I bet you're breaking women's hearts all over town. Well... The reason I ask, Glenn, is you're one of the only players on our roster that isn't married yet. And we're just wondering why that was. Oh, uh, uh, well, well, I just want to focus on ball, you know. It took me a long time to get to the majors, and I just want to make sure that I do all that I can to stay in the league. I hear you, and we appreciate that. We really do. It's just, you know, the Dodgers prefer their players to be married. We believe that it settles them down and allows them to focus more on baseball and less on chasing women. Furthermore, when players get married on the Dodgers, we help them out financially. We can help you so you can go out and have a really nice honeymoon. So Glenn, have you ever thought about getting married? You mean to a woman? Yes, and we're prepared to pay you $75,000 to do so. $75,000? That's three times what I made all last season. We know. Like I said, we like to make sure our players have a really nice honeymoon. Look, Al, I have no plans of marrying anyone anytime soon. Oh, no? No. But Glenn, don't you want to meet a nice lady and settle down, get a piece of land? Owning real estate in California is a great investment that will help you long after you retire. We know some great real estate agents who can help you find a nice place with a yard for some kids. Don't you want kids, Glenn? The happiest people in the world are married and have kids. I know. But all that doesn't interest me just yet. Someday, maybe. I just turned 25. I understand. Disappointed, but understand. We were just hoping you'd be excited by our offer. We thought it was more than generous. Oh no, Mr. Campanis. I mean, Al. I'm grateful. I very much am, and thank you. It's just that marriage is a big commitment. I wouldn't want to rush into anything and run the risk of things not working out. That wouldn't be fair to anyone. No, I suppose it wouldn't be. But like I said, we like our players to be married. It's important to us. It's the Dodger way. You're a good player, Glenn, with a bright future ahead of you in this game. We have a lot we want to accomplish here, and we want you to be part of it. We'd hate to lose you over something foolish. I'm ready to go now. You don't mind if I don't want to talk, do you? No, not at all. That's fine by me. Early spring, 1978, West Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Spunky! Hey yo, Spunky! Spunky! Oh my god, what? What do you want? Why haven't you been returning my calls? I've been busy. Bitch, doing what? Doing... Busy. Just busy, okay? Look, I gotta go. Don't you want to hang out with me? I don't want to see you anymore. Don't want to see me? Spunky. Look, I can't see you anymore. Just leave me alone. Can't see me anymore? Spunky. Hey, Spunky. Why can't you see me anymore? Hey, Spunky. Who paid for this nice big apartment, huh? I know you didn't get it being a tailor's apprentice. How much? How much are the Dodgers paying you to not see me anymore? You're a pussy, Spunky. A real bitch-ass pussy for this. You should come out. After spending so much time concealing a simple thing that would destroy me. That's Glenn Burr. That's my boyfriend. Everyone in the Dodgers thinks we're dating. It's the Dodger way. Look, I can't see you anymore. Just leave me alone. Do 
This is the body of Supervisor Harvey Milk as it was taken from City Hall. Witnesses say after killing the mayor, White ran down the hall and fired three shots at Milk, killing him. Milk had opposed the reappointment of White. In the total confusion after the shooting, the president of the Board of Supervisors, Diane Feinstein, spoke. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. Suspect July 1979 BW's apartment The Castro San Francisco, California Glenn Where have you been, bitch? I've been partying in the neighborhood And not returning our phone calls We heard you quit baseball. Yep. Why? I just needed a mental break. Some time to get my head right. Partying all day and night for weeks on end isn't going to help that. Get off my back. We're just... We're worried about you. What are you going to do for work? Let me worry about that. I just don't know how you could quit something you love and that so few people get to do. You don't understand how homophobic the game is. The anxiety of having to lead a double life. Always looking over my shoulder... Wondering if they know. Well, you said the Dodgers knew. They had to. How are you going to trade your top prospect to Oakland for Billy North? Billy North? The fans must have been on to me, too. Calling me a faggot. Had to kick one of their asses after a game at the Coliseum. (gasps) You got into a fight with a fan? Yeah, I found him after the game in the parking lot. I would have killed that motherfucker, too, if someone didn't intervene. Oh, my God. The A's are just uninspiring to be around. I've never seen what was supposed to be a professional outfit care less about winning. It was exhausting to be around. But part of me feels bad. About what? As much as it hurts to see my teammates avoiding me and talking behind my back, I didn't want my presence to be a burden to them. I didn't want them to feel uncomfortable or for their families to be uneasy. Oakland Athletics Spring Training, 1980, Scottsdale, Arizona. So, Billy, I see Glenn Burks back in the mix. Can we expect him to be your everyday center fielder? No faggot's going to contaminate my team. I'd let you print that, but we're right next to the fag capital of the world. And those sissies would have my job quicker than Steinbrenner did. These fudge packers have more rights than you and I now. There used to be ways of dealing with these types of people. (laughs) Jesus, Martin. What? It's true. Nineteen eighty one. Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. Robert Brazil now in Atlanta. Bobby Campbell of San Francisco and Billy Walker of New York both suffer from a mysterious newly discovered disease which affects mostly homosexual men, but has also been found in heterosexual men and women. The condition severely weakens the body's ability to fight disease. Many victims get a rare form of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. Others get an infection known as pneumocystis pneumonia. Researchers know of 413 people who have contracted the condition in the past year. One third have died and none have been cured. Death didn't scare me. It was was, uh, living with this for a long time. That's more frightening than, than death. Investigators have examined the habits of homosexuals for clues. I was in the fast lane at one time in terms of the way that I lived my life, and now I'm not. The best guess is that some infectious agent is causing it. 
Today, researchers here at the National Centers for Disease Control said they had found several cases where people who had been sex partners both had the condition. The scientists say this probably means they are dealing with some new, deadly, sexually transmitted disease. The investigators see this as a serious public health problem. From an epidemic point of view, uh, there have been more deaths from Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia than have occurred with all the cases of toxic shock syndrome and the Philadelphia outbreak of Legionnaire's disease combined. Researchers are now studying blood and other samples from the victims, trying to learn what is causing the disease. So far, they have had no luck. Robert Bazell, NBC News, Atlanta. Late summer, 1982, B.W.'s apartment, the Castro, San Francisco, California. B.W., how did your little sexual rendezvous go last night? Yes, but more importantly, B.W., spell rendezvous. Bitch. (laughs) I was going to tell you, but never mind. Oh, so she does know how to be quiet. Have I told you how much I hate you? Uh, I don't know. Let me check the time. It's only been 20 minutes. I hate you. (laughs) Oh shit, I forgot to tell you. Michael has a plan to try and get me back to playing in the majors. Girl, you two are exhausting. You're together, then you're not together. He really wants to help me this time. He's going to write my story for Inside Sports Magazine. I'm even going to New York in a couple of weeks to talk to Brian Gumbel on the Today Show. Oh my goodness, baby. Wait, how is this supposed to get you back? back in baseball. I'm hoping a team will appreciate my honesty and give me a second chance. And if they don't? Then hopefully it will help other gay men who are struggling. Do you think you're ready to come out to the world? As ready as I'll ever be. How did your families handle the news when you came out to them? Oof. What? Not good? Both of our families stopped talking to us. Oh no. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. It's hard to go through life without your family on your side. How did your family take it, Glenn? My mom and siblings were cool. I don't know about my dad. He left a month before my first birthday. He's living with his new family up in Alaska. September 13th, 1982. NBC Studios, New York City, New York. As I said a little earlier in this half hour, it's not uncommon for someone in the public eye to come forth and admit that he or she is a homosexual. But it is fairly uncommon when that person is a Major League Baseball player. I'd like you to meet Glenn Burke right now. Glenn Burke is retired from baseball, but was a member of the Los Angeles Dodgers and with the Oakland A's, appealed in the World Series in 1977. What'd you go? One for five? One for five. One for five. The current issue of Inside Sports, the one just hitting the newsstands today, his story is told. The double life of a gay Dodger. Glenn, why'd you decide to tell your story now? Well, when it came to the point where I was uncomfortable, I thought the world should know how I felt. So, when I got fed up with the situation, thought I'd tell people about it. How long were you keeping it to yourself? Mm, maybe four or five years. When you were in the major leagues? Uh, yep. Why is it particularly difficult to be gay and be in the major leagues? Why is that arena so uncompromising? Well, it's not real difficult. It's just a problem that the people that you like and live with and work with might not understand. You know, the problem of being gay and a professional baseball player. Did you ever give them a chance to understand? Um, no. I was just pretty much myself at that time, so it really didn't matter. How and when did people in baseball come to find out that you were gay? Uh, hmm. I guess from hearsay. Because I hadn't said a thing. I was just, you know, working and playing ball and living a regular life, I thought. Was it difficult for you to hide? I mean, I know in the article how the guys always wanted you to go out drinking with them, and you had your own places you wanted to go to, and they were always wondering why you weren't with somebody that they had tried to set you up with. Yeah. 
also like more considerate of them instead of myself. And I didn't want to embarrass nobody or make them feel unease. So I thought if I just kept it to myself for a while until I was ready to tell them that they might understand if they got to like me first instead of what I've done, you know, sexually or something like that. Well, there had to be, and there has to be, other major leaguers who are gay. Why don't you try to talk to anybody about your problems? Well, it's kind of hard, because you don't know who to talk to. And if you confront somebody, they might not want to talk about it. And at that time, I felt like it wasn't necessary. I was trying to accomplish something, and I really didn't have time to talk about my sexual life, because I think it should be private. Did the officials on the ball clubs you were with also think it should be private? Um, mm, I'm really not sure. Did any of them give you a bad time about it? No. I'm a little bit too big for that, for somebody to give me a bad time. <laughs> hey, you said that. But you even made a note in the article that you had a tough problem in your own mind balancing out this big macho Glenn Burke with what your idea of a gay person should have been, and that was a sissy. Yeah, so like stereotyping myself. So you were anxious to use your body to show them you weren't what they thought. That's right. I'm just human like everybody else, and I'm a man. If I'm gay, I'm still a man, and that's the way I carry myself. Did the Dodgers trade you because you were gay? I'm not quite sure. I'm still wondering about that, but in due time, I guess it will all come out in the end. You told a story in the article that a Dodger official, in fact, called you in and offered you money if you'd get married, in a roundabout way. Is that right? Well, in a roundabout way, he said, usually, when the ball players make the major leagues, if they're married, they're more responsible, and we usually give them a little bit of money to have a good honeymoon or something like that. But I told him out front, I don't think I'll be getting married for a while, so they dropped the subject after that. Were you traded from the Dodgers to the A's because you were gay? Um, I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah. How about your teammates? I knew you when you were in L.A. You were among the most popular guys on the ball club. You were a little bit rowdy, but you had a lot of fun. I was from Oakland. You were from Oakland. <laughs> yeah, you were probably the loudest guy on the team, but you were good people. Did their attitudes change after they found out? I don't think so. There were a few people who made some snide remarks on the side. Basically, the good people, they treated me real well, which was Davey Lopes, Dusty Baker, Steve Garvey, Don Sutton, Lee Lacey, Tommy John. They respected me, and I think they still do. You're 30 years old. Baseball's behind you now. What are you doing? I'm working towards another lifestyle, I guess. Eventually, I want to be a coach, if that's possible. I really have to go back to school and get my education. Do you think that's even possible with people knowing? Anything is possible. What's the hat for? Um... This is from the softball team I played on during the summer. We won the Gay World Series, and they wanted me to give you this hat. That's from San Francisco, the pendulum. Thank you very much. It's a long way from the L.A. Dodgers in more ways than one. But I'm having more fun now. Yeah, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, Bryant. Much appreciated. Nineteen eighty three, East Bay, Oakland, California. I can't believe Alana is gone. I know. Who would stab a mother of five, Luther? It's terrible, but I guess that's just the world we live in. Alona was such an amazing sister to us. She would come to the funerals of my friends who died from AIDS and put pink carnations on their caskets. Speaking of that, I heard they're thinking about closing the bathhouses. You're being safe, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah yeah me, Glenn. I'm being serious. You know I'm not judging you. I'm just worried for your safety. I know, and I am. Can we talk about something else, please? How's living at Mom's? It's good. I enjoy spending time with Sydney. Trying to be a positive male role model for our baby bro, you know? What are you doing for work? Just odd jobs here and there. Nothing steady yet. I can't believe Michael made out with all that money from your Inside Sports article. Tell me you're finally done with that shyster. I am. Nineteen eighty seven, intersection of Noe Street and Sixteenth Street, the Castro, San Francisco, California. (coughs) 
Knock, knock. Hey, Glenn. Oh, my goodness. Jack McGowan? Coming to my hospital bed to see little old me? How you feeling, Top Dog? I don't feel like no Top Dog today. Well, how bad is it? Both my legs are shattered. They had to put a rod in one of them to stabilize it. Oh, Sugar, I'm so sorry. How's the softball team? Let's just say that you are sorely missed both on and off the field. We got you this card that everyone signed and some pink carnations for your room. Oof. What is it? Pink carnations are what my sister Alona would put on the casket of my friends who died from AIDS. I heard about B.W. and Wes. I'm so sorry, Glenn. I know they were very special to you. Yeah, thanks. They were sick and in a lot of pain for a long time. Wes was living in the streets when he died. His landlord evicted him when he got sick. They found B.W. in his apartment six weeks after he passed away alone because no one was looking after him. They were the first two friends I met the first night I came to the Castro. I remember that night at the Pendulum. I was there, remember? I was still helping run the place back then. Oh my gosh, that's right. Wow. That felt like another lifetime ago. I was a king back then, wasn't I? You still are. I don't feel like a king. No? It just feels like the community doesn't love me the way they used to. No, Glenn, you're wrong. I love you, but you're wrong about this one. Many gay people have tried to help you because we love you. Because you're a hero to us. It hurts me that you can't see this. I appreciate that, but I suppose I won't be a hero for much longer. What are you talking about? I have HIV. Nineteen ninety one, San Francisco Superior Courthouse, San Francisco, California. Mr. Burke, you have been arrested and pled guilty to possession of a controlled substance, crack cocaine. I sentence you to sixteen months at San Quentin State Prison with possible parole after six months. Nineteen ninety four, Oakland Athletics General Manager Sandy Alderson's office, Oakland Coliseum, Oakland, California. Hello, this is Sandy Alderson. What can I do for you? You should be ashamed of yourself. Excuse me? One of your former players is dying on the streets. May I ask who I'm speaking to? My name is Jack McGowan. I organize the Gay Softball League and manage a couple bars in San Francisco. Hello, Mr. McGowan. You were talking about a former player of ours? Yes. His name is Glenn Burke. He played with Oakland from 78 to 80. Yes, I remember Glenn. That was a year before I got here, but I do remember him. Well, what you don't seem to know is that he's living on the streets of the Castro and no one is helping him. He's dying of AIDS and no one is helping him. Baseball should be ashamed of itself. Fall, 1994. Luther Burke's home, Oakland, California. Glenn, baby, did you have enough to eat? Yes, thank you. Pig's feet are my favorite. You ate pretty well tonight. Here, let me rub your feet for you. I can't believe what the A's are doing to help me. Mrs. Pamela Pitt set up a tab at Welcome Home Restaurant where I can eat whenever I want. She connected me with Father Purcell in Marty's place. It feels like my dignity has finally been restored. That's great, little brother. Who would have thought that the team that finally ran you out of baseball would be your saving grace? I know. Luther, do you remember that time I came home crying from Bushrod Park because that kid made fun of me? Yes, and I went over there and straightened his ass out. No one messes with my family. <laughs> I was such a punk back then. Glenn, are you happy? Yes. I have no regrets, if that's what you're asking. I just want to know if you're satisfied. You weren't dealt with the luckiest of hands. That's okay, Luther dear. I don't harbor any ill will towards anyone. 
I've made my peace with everything. Although I wish that I could have talked to Michael and Spunky one last time before they got sick and died. Poor Tommy Lasorda can't even admit that his son was gay and had AIDS. Can you imagine burying your own son? I don't want to. It's been a very hard few years, but I know that I'll be in heaven with the Lord soon. Oh, Glenn. It's okay. I'm happy to be seeing my friends again, to see Alona. I hope people remember me as a down-to-earth guy, a man who tried to never have a bad thought in his mind, a man who really tried to get along with everybody at all times. I have no regrets about the way I lived my life. I did the best I could. Well, maybe I do have just one regret. What's that? Should have been a basketball player. <laughs> Glenn Burke was an American athlete who played baseball professionally from 1972 to 1980. Selected in the 17th round of the 1972 Amateur Player Draft by the Los Angeles Dodgers, Burke played in the Dodgers minor league system beginning in 1972, before being called up to major league service for part of the 1976 season. He returned to the Dodgers minor league system for the start of the 1977 season before becoming a full-time major league player for the rest of that year. He was traded to the Oakland Athletics in May of 1978. After a partial retirement from baseball in June 1979, Burke returned to the A's for spring training in 1980, but was reassigned to minor league camp later that spring before retiring for good. Burke, a closeted homosexual man during his playing career, contended that he was blacklisted from Major League Baseball, MLB, as his closely guarded sexuality became an open secret in the league sometime during his rookie season in 1977. Glenn Burke was born on November 16, 1952, in Oakland, California, to parents Alice and Luther Burke. Glenn was the fifth of six children, four older sisters, Beverly, Lutha, Joyce, and Alona, and one younger brother, Sidney. By the time Glenn was 11 months old, his father had moved out of the house. Though he'd occasionally come back to visit, Luther eventually started a new life with a new family far away in Alaska. Glenn grew up in the East Bay or the eastern region of the San Francisco Bay Area. Life in the East Bay of the 50s and 60s was filled with mounting economic and social pressures. Manufacturing jobs that employed area residents disappeared after World War II, taking with them the more affluent white population. Fewer jobs, freeway construction, and urban renewal projects decimated businesses and neighborhoods and eroded city services. Poor Southern whites who relocated to the Bay Area for wartime jobs were recruited to join the police force and brought with them their Dixie racial attitudes and used their state-sanctioned power to abuse minorities. Despite these tensions and the occasional interruptions brought on by Luther's infrequent visits, the Burke home was mostly filled with love and laughter. With the protection of his older sisters, and the friendships of an ethnically diverse neighborhood, Glenn found refuge at the playground, in church, drawing, listening to music, and singing. Burke thrived as an athlete, spending long hours at the park, playing pickup games in any sport besides football, which his mother forbade him from playing. Located in North Oakland, near the border of Berkeley, Bushrod Park, was the battleground where the top players from each city met to see who was the king of the East Bay. Glenn could easily outperform anyone in any aspect of any sport or competition. With basketball being the favorite sport of Burke, he intentionally picked teammates no one else wanted and still won game after game as an act of compassion and defiance to the machismo, schoolyard bullying otherwise rampant in such locations. 
an attitude that followed him throughout his short life. Glenn's athletic prowess continued at Berkeley High, where the legend of his physical abilities grew. It was said that Burke could stand flat-footed underneath a basketball hoop, jump in the air, triple pump, and dunk the ball behind his head. Then there was the time he hit a baseball so hard it ripped through a chain-link fence over 300 feet away. Never one to lift weights, Burke's Adonis-like physique and athletic talent was truly God-given. In his senior year at Berkeley High in 1970, Glenn led the Yellow Jackets basketball team to an undefeated season that culminated with a title in the Tournament of Champions. Aside from his athletic gifts, Glenn was a born entertainer. Apart from a beautiful singing voice, he was also the funniest kid in his class. He perfectly mimicked popular black comedians of the day and could also cut his buddies to shreds with improvised freestyle riffs known as hoorah. Kids would bust on each other's clothes, the way they walked or talked, and even their family. Glenn was the hoorah champion. Outside of sports, Glenn was aimless. He showed little interest in school and other non-sports related ventures. He spent many an afternoon in his high school years getting high with friends, planting the seeds of his eventual downfall in plain sight. The two years between Burke's high school graduation and him signing a minor league contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers were spent attending college parties where he was the center of attention and short stints as a college athlete at four different universities on the West Coast often as a two-sport athlete in basketball and baseball. It was his athletic production and ability at Merritt College in Oakland that attracted professional scouts in both the MLB and the NBA. As a Bay Area kid, Burke loathed the Los Angeles Dodgers and had resigned himself to hold out until his beloved San Francisco Giants came knocking on his mother's door. The $5,000 that were to be all his as a lucrative signing bonus was what forced Burke to swallow his pride and sign with the enemies in Dodger blue. On his way to the major leagues, Glenn played in the Dodgers minor league affiliate cities that included Spokane, Washington, Ogden, Utah, Daytona Beach, Florida, Bakersfield, California, Waterbury, Connecticut, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Burke performed well and rose through the minor league ranks in a relatively quick manner. Despite his impressive play and the obvious potential he possessed as one of the Dodgers' top prospects, Burke's minor league career was marred with interpersonal strife both on and off the playing field. As a center fielder, Burke's aggressive and overly competitive style of play mixed with an often hot-headedness put a target on his back not only from his competitors but from inside the Dodgers organization as well. Burke was involved in several on-field physical altercations and routinely butted heads with coaches and the Dodger front office. So much so that the Dodgers implemented minders to keep daily tabs on their top prospects. One theory to explain Glenn's battles on the field was the battle he was waging on himself off the field in coming to terms with his own homosexuality. As a charismatic, good-looking, athletic, and funny life-of-the-party type, Glenn no doubt fended off many potential female suitors growing up in Northern California during the Free Love Revival movement of the late 60s and early 1970s. With the prospect of becoming a major league ball player, Burke knew he had to focus on honing his skills, particularly hitting major league pitching, and chose to abstain from anything that would distract him from his goals, and that included dating and sex. Burke's hyper-focus caused him to delay realizing that he was homosexual until his 1975 minor league season in Waterbury, Connecticut. Burke was 23 at the time he realized he was gay and wanted to enjoy the pleasures of being a gay man, albeit a closeted one. That offseason, Glenn reconnected with a junior high school teacher he had a crush on, Mr. Mendler. After their first sexual encounter together, Glenn returned home and cried alone in his room for four hours from relief. 
He was relieved to realize for the first time that he was indeed a gay man. Burke was quoted in his autobiography, Out at Home, the Glenn Burke story, that, quote, I had never been able to understand why the other guys at school got so strange when they'd fall in love with some girl from school. I would think to myself, I'm missing that feeling. So when I found that loving feeling, it was very emotional. It was also in the 1975 off-season that Burke made his first pilgrimage to San Francisco's Castro District. The Castro is a neighborhood in Eureka Valley in San Francisco, California. The Castro was one of the first gay neighborhoods in the United States. Having transformed from a working-class neighborhood through the 1960s and 70s, the Castro remains one of the most prominent symbols of the LGBTQIA activism and events in the world. It was there in the fall of 1975 that Glenn made some of his first lifelong friendships with others in the gay community. It was also there at a bar on Folsom Street that Glenn first met Michael Smith the man who was to be Glenn's on-again, off-again lover for the next six years, just prior to returning to Albuquerque for the 1976 season. Burke would spend most of the next five off-seasons living with various friends in the Castro as a refuge between leading his double life as a closeted gay professional athlete. With the realization that he was gay came a new responsibility for Glenn as he needed to find a way to live his life without the secret of his sexuality becoming known, as that would be the end of everything he had spent his whole life working towards. Members of the LGBTQ community were vilified even well before the outbreak of the HIV-AIDS crisis in the early 1980s. Homosexuals and transgendered persons were and still are seen as deviants, predators, and even psychopaths. In April 1952, the American Psychiatric Association, APA, listed homosexuality as a, quote, sociopathic personality disturbance, classifying any sexual orientation that is not heterosexuality as a mental illness. It would stay that way until December 15, 1973, when the APA removed homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. Homosexuality was a crime across the United States, with Illinois becoming the first state to decriminalize homosexuality on January 1, 1962. The Stonewall Riots in June 1969 is credited with sparking the modern-day gay rights movement when Stonewall bar patrons rebelled against ongoing police raids used to harass gay and transgendered persons. Nightly clashes with the police occurred for three straight nights beginning on June 28, 1969. A parade commemorating the one-year anniversary of the Stonewall Riots is considered the country's first gay pride parade. In December 1975, retired NFL player Dave Cope came out as gay. After a cup of coffee with the Dodgers during the 1976 season, including making his major league debut on the road against his childhood team and hometown San Francisco Giants, Burke became a full-time Major League ball player partway through the 1977 season. Burke would be part of one of the most celebrated Dodger teams of all time, a team that includes superstars Steve Garvey, Reggie Smith, Dusty Baker, Ron Say, Davey Lopes, and Don Sutton. Led by first-year manager Tommy Lasorda, the 1977 Dodgers' historic season saw them win the Western Division by 10 games, over then back-to-back world champion Cincinnati Reds and defeat the Philadelphia Phillies to win the National League pennant before ultimately losing to the New York Yankees in the World Series in six games. Burke appeared in three games of that fall classic, including starting in center field in Game 1 at Yankee Stadium. Glenn was also front and center for another monumental moment in sports history in the fall of 1977. 
On the last day of the 1977 regular season, the Dodgers were on the verge of becoming the first team in baseball history to have four players hit 30 or more home runs. With Steve Garvey, Reggie Smith, and Ron Say having already accomplished the feat, left fielder Dusty Baker had been sitting on 29 homers for nearly a week. Facing the ace of the Houston Astros pitching rotation, J.R. Richard, Baker took Richard deep in the bottom of the Dodgers' sixth inning. As Baker crossed the plate, the first person to greet him was on-deck hitter Glenn Burke, who, overcome with emotion for his friend's achievement and the 46,000 home Dodger fans screaming in delight, did not shake Baker's hand, nor did he choose to hug his teammate. Instead, he shouted, Way to go! Way to go! and held his right hand high over and behind his head, inviting Baker to slap it, which he emphatically did. Without intending to, Burke had just invented the now ubiquitous high five. Not to be outdone, Burke took Richard Deep the very next at bat for his first career home run. The now universal greeting and celebration became the official Dodger salute of the 1980 Dodgers season, including a high-dollar Hollywood marketing campaign compete with colorfully designed merchandise that went uncredited and uncompensated by a man who in that very season was forced to retire from the game he loved after being blacklisted by the MLB for being a homosexual. Somewhere in Burke's rookie season in 1977, questions began to arise surrounding his personal life. Teammates and the Dodger organization noticed that Burke never seemed to date any women. Glenn was always popular, charming, charismatic, attractive, and playing for the Dodgers made him one of the most eligible bachelors in Hollywood in the late 70s. People always tried to fix Glenn up with women only to have him find some physical or personal defect with the potential suitor. Burke rarely hung out with teammates after games, making up elaborate lies as to why he could not hang out with his friends on the team. Glenn was often seen being picked up by different groups of male friends from ballparks and airports. Teammates wondered aloud to each other about Burke's preferences, but never asked him directly, knowing it would be career suicide if it were to become known that he was gay. Singer, spokeswoman, and outspoken anti-gay activist Anita Bryant formed the American political coalition Save Our Children in 1977 in Miami, Florida in an attempt to overturn a recently legislated ordinance that banned discrimination in areas of housing, employment, and public accommodation based on sexual orientation. On June 7, 1977, the campaign successfully overturned the Gay Rights Ordinance in Dade County, Florida. On November 8, 1977, gay businessman and community leader Harvey Milk was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, becoming the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in California. One year later, on November 27, 1978, Milk and San Francisco Mayor George Moscone were shot and killed inside San Francisco City Hall by former Supervisor Dan White. During the offseason between the 1977 and 1978 season, Burke received a call from Dodger General Manager Al Campanis asking for a meeting. The meeting was to take place in Oakland, with Glenn considering the meeting to be an assessment of his 1977 rookie campaign, his role on the 78 club, and a potential discussion on a possible contract extension. Burke considered Campanus a good friend, someone who had taken special interest in Burke's life and had taken him under his wing as he moved through the organization, making what actually occurred in their meeting that much more painful. Campanis knew Glenn was gay and had a plan to cover it up. Campanis told Burke that he was one of the few Dodger players not to be married. The Dodgers preferred their players to get married as it was their belief that it settled them down and allowed them to focus more on baseball. He went on to explain the long-running tradition of the Dodger organization to help newly married players out financially as a way to help them have a nice honeymoon. In response to the marriage question, Glenn asked a question of his own by replying, quote, You mean to a woman? 
Campana said yes, and the club was prepared to pay him $75,000, an amount equivalent to the average annual Major League salary at that time, and roughly three times as much money as Burke made in the entire 1977 season. Glenn told Campanis that he had no plans of marrying anyone anytime soon. The meeting lasted several hours as Campanis made his bid to Burke to find a woman and settle down, making it clear that his career with the Dodgers would be in jeopardy if he didn't follow through with their wishes. Glenn refused. As the 1978 season drew near, Glenn felt the isolation from the Dodgers' revelation of his sexuality envelop him. He had become close with Tommy Lasorda Jr., the flamboyant and openly gay son of then-Dodger manager Tommy Lasorda. Nicknamed Spunky, Lasorda Jr. and Burke spent an increasing amount of time together. Sometime after the marriage meeting, Spunky suddenly cut off all communication with Glenn, who suspected that the team had paid Spunky off to end his relationship with Burke. Spunky died from AIDS-related illnesses in 1991. He was 33 years old. Lasorda Sr. at the time of his son's death refuted reports that his son was gay, insisting that he died from pneumonia and dehydration. Years later, Lasorda Sr. privately admitted to his son's sexuality that he had died from complications brought on by AIDS and that he apologized for his homophobia. Burke received limited playing time in the 1978 season as it became obvious that the Dodgers were not going to accept having a gay player on their roster. On May 16th, Burke was traded to the Oakland Athletics for veteran outfielder Billy North. The effect of this sudden trade echoed across the Dodger locker room as the idea of their top prospect and lifeblood of their team sank in. Burke was the ideal teammate, the first to congratulate another player's performance and the first to get on others who weren't as supportive. Off the field, Glenn cut the team loose bringing the same vibrant, childlike enthusiasm he exhibited on the playground and schools he grew up on back home in the East Bay. Telling jokes, cutting up teammates with his off-the-cuff hoorahs, and deadpan impersonations of manager Tommy Lasorda. Burke could be seen blasting his beloved stereo from his locker and dancing around the clubhouse to the hottest disco songs of the day in his brightly colored jockstraps. An attitude and sense of swagger that was sorely missed once Burke was shipped out to Oakland. After the initial sting and anger from being traded to Oakland wore off, Burke embraced the opportunity for more playing time in his own backyard. The A's of the late 70s were polar opposites of the great A's dynasty that won five straight pennants and three straight World Series in the early to mid 70s. Burke became frustrated by the team's lackluster performance, their lack of drive, and the town's disinterest in the team, playing to a nearly empty ballpark night after night. Increasingly depressed by his current situation, Glenn lost control of his anger. After a game at the Oakland Coliseum in the early part of the 1979 season, Burke got into a physical altercation outside the clubhouse with a fan who could be heard calling Glenn a faggot while playing center field. After losing a heartbreaker to the Cleveland Indians on June 4th, Glenn decided that he could no longer tolerate the homophobia in professional baseball and suddenly retired. The stagnant A's front office turned heads in the 1979 offseason by hiring fiery and problematic manager Billy Martin. It was Martin's Yankees that defeated Burke's Dodgers in the 1977 World Series. Being an East Bay kid himself, Billy Martin was also an alumnus of Berkeley High, the same high school Glenn attended. Inspired by their latest hire, Burke reported to A's spring training to prepare for the 1980 season. The good vibes were short-lived as Burke had to undergo surgery that first week to repair cartilage in his knee from an injury the previous year, a surgery that required a three-month rehab. Martin, a known racist and homophobe, could be heard referring to Glenn as a faggot to other members of the organization just outside of earshot of Burke, and over the course of that spring repeatedly told table mates and members of the press at a local bar 
that there was no way that he was going to let a gay man, quote, contaminate his team. Martin signed Burke's death warrant when he assigned him to Oakland's AAA affiliate in Ogden, Utah, the same place Burke began his minor league career in the Dodgers organization eight years prior. After 25 games, Burke was hitting just 226. He was driving 60 miles a day from his apartment in Salt Lake City to escape the homophobia in Ogden. His teammates avoided him. Billy Martin hated him. His left knee hurt. The Castro beckoned him. Seeing no other option, Glenn Burke would retire from the sport he loved for good at age 27. Though still reeling from being blacklisted from baseball, Burke dove headfirst into the bustling gay scene of the Castro district. No longer having to look over his shoulder or lie about where he was going or what he was doing, Glenn was free to be his true self for the first time in his life. Cloyd Jenkins, a close friend of Burke, had this to say of this transformational period in his friend's life. Quote, To Glenn, the Castro was the diametrical opposite of the emotional prison he had been living in all his life. To love and be loved, his soul was starving for that fundamental human drive. In the Castro, it was safe to finally explore all those little things that are gigantic if they are denied to you. To openly tease and flirt, actually touch, hold hands, even kiss in public without fear of all hell breaking loose around you. The pervasive disguise you constructed all around your life now belonged to the dumpster. Glenn's appearance at that particular time and place in the gay movement could not have been more apropos. To have a former Major League player and such a sexually attractive man in their orbit made Burke the center of the universe when he made the Castro his permanent residence by the summer of 1980. Moreover, it was Glenn's benevolent personality that cemented his icon status in the community. Burke treated everyone as equals and even went out of his way to mentor young gay black men who struggled with accepting their identity. With no job prospects or marketable skills outside of athletics, Burke embraced another booming aspect of his new community, gay softball leagues. Gay community recreation leagues originated in the early 70s and were immensely popular, expanding to big cities all over North America by the 1980s. Leagues were highly competitive and were huge social gatherings that promoted camaraderie and forged lifelong friendships. Being an ex-pro athlete, Burke jumped at the chance to scratch his competitive itch. Though admittedly, as someone who was used to hitting 90 mile per hour plus pitching from some of the greatest pitchers in baseball history, it took Burke a while to adjust to the slow, underhand style the leagues were based on. Once acclimated, Burke became the hardest out in the league and could cover entire sides of an infield by himself. Burke played on teams that won the Gay Softball League World Series and even earned medals competing in the Gay Olympics. Burke made one last Hail Mary attempt at returning to pro ball in September 1982 with an unconventional tactic. For years, Glenn's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Michael Smith, who thought himself somewhat of a queer activist, pushed Burke to publicly come out of the closet during his playing days. What would have been career suicide for Glenn to Michael would have been a huge step forward in breaking barriers that gay men could do anything their straight counterparts could. He even went as far as almost outing Burke during the highly publicized 1977 World Series after Glenn refused to do so himself. During team introductions prior to the start of a couple of games, Michael, sitting close to the field in seats that Burke secured for him, tried to draw attention to himself as Glenn's boyfriend before mutual friends intervened. Smith arranged for Burke to publicly come out and tell his story to Inside Sports magazine in the fall of 1982 in an article called The Double Life of a Gay Dodger. Burke looked forward to being paid handsomely for his revelation. To promote the article's release, Burke appeared on the Today Show on September 13, 1982 to share his story with Bryant Gumbel. It was Glenn's hope that his honesty would earn him another shot in the major leagues. 
The big splash never came as the article was met with indifference from the public at large. Michael pocketed all the money that came from the article. Burke would never get his chance to prove himself to any major league club and the last of Glenn's good days were mostly behind him as the nation's attention focused on a new threat that began killing people by the thousands. The Castro became ground zero for a new virus. In June 1981, a publication for the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, described the unusual cases of three gay men at UCLA Medical Center who complained of high fever and extreme weight loss. Other symptoms also included severe yeast infections in the mouth and throat, a lethal form of pneumonia, and the absence of white blood cells that trigger the body's immune response. Physicians in New York and San Francisco responded to the article saying that they too had seen the same symptoms in their patients as well as the appearance of Kaposi's sarcoma, a rare skin cancer. Within days, the Associated Press picked up the story and for the first time, Americans began hearing and reading about gay men dying from a mysterious new illness. Researchers will later discover the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, is a sexually transmitted infection caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, a virus that destroys the right blood cells that protect the body from disease. For a person to become infected with HIV, infected blood, semen, or vaginal secretions must enter their body most often through sex without a condom or through intravenous drug use with a contaminated needle. Someone can have an HIV infection for several years, living symptom-free before developing AIDS. When HIV AIDS first appeared in the U.S., it mainly affected men who had sex with men. With causes of AIDS still unknown, gay men were initially at particular risk for a number of reasons. With no potential for pregnancy, they often had sex without condoms. The disease spreads more easily through anal than vaginal sex. Many gay men had more than one sexual partner, increasing their potential exposure. In 1983, not long after his appearance on the Today Show and publication of his article in Inside Sports, Glenn's sister, Ilona, a former track star and mother of five children, was stabbed to death during a robbery. The widespread occurrence of HIV AIDS in the gay community in the early 1980s undid years of progression in terms of shifting public acceptance of the gay community who were once again being seen as sick and untouchable, reviving dormant prejudices and justified existing ones. By 1984, the Castro had become a surreal ghost town where sidewalks were crowded with young, zombie-like men walking with canes. Bathhouses and private sex clubs in San Francisco were closed by late 1984. It wasn't until September 17, 1985 that President Ronald Reagan mentioned the word AIDS publicly for the first time in response to a reporter's question. He called it a, quote, top priority. On October 2nd of that year, Congress allocated nearly $190 million for AIDS research, $70 million more than the administration's request. Not till the spring of 1987 did Reagan make a major speech about AIDS, at a point where 36,058 Americans had become infected and 20,849 had died. It would not be until Irvin Magic Johnson, a heterosexual NBA superstar, announced to the world that he had contracted the HIV virus in 1991 that public opinion and the vilification of those who live with HIV AIDS began to shift to a more compassionate response. One night in 1987, while crossing the wide intersection at Noe and 16th Street in the Castro, Burke was struck by a vehicle. The car was being driven by a teenage girl who took her mother's car for a joyride. Having just ran a red light, the car made a sharp right turn before colliding with Burke and sending him flying through the air more than 70 feet down the road. Glenn's legs were shattered and required several surgeries and a rod in one leg to stabilize it. 
With Glenn recovering in the hospital, his sister Joyce, a nurse herself, was reviewing her brother's medical chart when she noticed an alarming code. Immunocompromised. Glenn Burke was HIV positive. For a man who was so involved in athletics, not being able to participate in his recreation leagues was a mortal blow to Glenn's psyche. Living off one odd job to another, Burke now spent less time looking for work and more time looking for drugs. Glenn graduated from cocaine to crack and wandered the streets of the Castro. Not wanting to put anyone out, Burke preferred homelessness over accepting various invitations to live with friends and family. Burke was now penniless, homeless, and severely drug addicted in the Castro. The neighborhood that once celebrated him now turned their back on him. At a party in early 1991, Burke was arrested for drug possession and served six months of a 16-month sentence at San Quentin Prison in the Bay Area. He was sent back to San Quentin a year later for one month after failing to report to his parole officer. Glenn was receiving assistance from the Oakland A's organization after a friend, Jack McGowan, had reached out on his behalf to then A's GM, Sandy Alderson, and informed him that the team had a former player who was dying on the streets near Oakland and, quote, no one is helping him. He is dying of AIDS and baseball should be ashamed of itself. Longtime A's employee, Pamela Pitts, was charged with helping to find sources of support for Glenn. She called the Association of Professional Ballplayers and the Baseball Assistance Team, two organizations supported by current and former players to assist low-income retirees. Both groups contributed $500, which Pitts used to establish a running tab at the Welcome Home restaurant in San Francisco, where Burke could charge meals to an account Pitts paid every few weeks. Pitts also arranged for Burke to have services provided at Marty's Place, a home set up by priest Richard Purcell to support others in his brother's memory who had died from AIDS while Purcell cared for him. For a man who has spent his lifetime chasing acceptance, love, and understanding, it was at Marty's Place that he finally found them. With his dignity restored, Glenn was ready to return home. Burke lived the last of his life with his sister Lutha, who was working a full-time job and raising two kids on her own, becoming her brother's full-time caregiver. Author Eric Sherman lived for a very short time with Lutha and Glenn to capture Glenn's life story for a book that he would write in Glenn's voice as an autobiography. The book titled Out at Home, the Glenn Burke story, was hoped to be released while Burke was still living, but was not able to find a publisher who all believed that the time to tell Glenn's story had passed. The book was eventually self-published after Burke's death. In the winter of 1994, a gala celebrating Glenn's life was arranged by friends in the East Bay. Burke very briefly attended the event in his honor before returning home due to his level of pain and AIDS-induced psychosis. Burke was not expected to live past Christmas of 1994. On May 30, 1995, at 2.34 p.m., while Lutha was away at work, Glenn passed away in her home. He was 42 years old. Burke was laid to rest on June 5th at Fouches Hudson's funeral home on Telegraph Avenue in Oakland. Father Richard Purcell of Marty's Place delivered the eulogy and said, quote, He died in truth. He told the truth. He didn't live a lie, and I believe the truth sets people free. Glenn's siblings surrounded his open casket to sing an a cappella version of the Hollies, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother then high-five one another before returning to their seats. On July 14, 2014, the MLB honored Burke during the All-Star Game at Minnesota Twins Target Field with Lutha, her daughter Alice Rose, and newly appointed Ambassador for Inclusion, former MLB player and now openly gay man Billy Bean in attendance. Then former Commissioner Bud Selig officially recognized Glenn's pioneering role for the first time. Speaking to the press, Luther said that her brother would be proud. 
but understood that the moment would only have true transformational power if little boys in the future had the chance to live out their major league dreams without fear of reprisal if they were gay. Abdul Jali Al-Hakim, a lifelong friend of Burke, had this to say about the impact of his friend's life, particularly the enduring spirit of Glenn's invention, the High Five. The High Five liberated everybody. It gave you permission to enjoy your high points. Heavy Head, Season 3, Episode 6, Lovers in a Dangerous Time, Series Finale, is written and produced by Tanner Hines. BW voiced by Andrew Dorier. Glenn Burke voiced by Mike Joseph. Wes Jackson voiced by Garrett Spritzer. Jack McGowan voiced by Rob Dorgan. Tommy Spunky Lasorda Jr. voiced by Scott Sanker. Al Campanis voiced by Steve Bolia. Michael Smith. Reporter Billy Martin. Judge Sandy Alderson and narrator voiced by Tanner Hines. Bryant Gumbel, voiced by Phil Pointer. Lutha Burke, voiced by Tara Cavendu. Narration and art design by Evan Verrilli. Boys Beware Audio, courtesy of Sid Davis Productions. 1975, 1976, and 1977 World Series and Dusty Baker Audio, courtesy of NBC and Major League Baseball. Anita Bryant, Harvey Milk, and HIV Audio, courtesy of NBC News. Award-winning original music by Real Blue Heartache Kids. The music is available online wherever you buy or stream music. If you or a loved one is experiencing a psychiatric emergency and live in the United States, please call or text 988 or text HOME to 741-741 for free and confidential support 24-7-365 from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and the Crisis Text Line. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the handle at HeavyHeadPod. Subscribe to our official YouTube page, HeavyHeadPodcast. You can email us at HeavyHeadPod at gmail.com. Please rate and review us on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Lastly, merch is available online at HeavyHead.BigCartel.com. Thank you for your support the last three years. Please stay in touch and take care of yourself.